Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome to Basketball History 101. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we're going to talk about two stories that are very much connected. The first is about the lowest scoring game in NBA history, which directly leads to the second story about the invention of the shot clock. On Wednesday, November 22nd, 1950, the Minneapolis Lakers were playing host to the Fort Wayne Pistons, who later became the Detroit Pistons. So let me set the scene for you. On that night, the Lakers were the reigning, two-time defending NBA champions. They were an extremely tough team loaded with Hall of Famers like Slater Martin, Jim Pollard, and the big man in the middle, George Mikan. Mikan was the first true superstar of the NBA. It also happened to be Father's Son Night at the Minneapolis Auditorium. The promotion said that for just 50 cents, a father and son could get two seats to see their beloved champions. The place was packed with all these dads wanting to show their sons the wonderful and amazing game of professional basketball. But what they got that night was the basketball equivalent of watching paint dry. The Lakers back then played a slow style of basketball and they did so for one basic reason. George Mikan, their leader, wasn't that fast. At six foot 10, he was the tallest and most dominant player in the NBA in one sense, he was the Shaq of his day, but he was also one of the slowest. If they got the defensive rebound, they were in no hurry to get down court. The fast break was not in their wheelhouse. They would basically wait for Mikan to drag his lumbering body down court, and then they would set up their half-court offense. While it wasn't exciting, it was very, very effective. The Lakers would win five championships in their first six years in the league using this style with this core group of players. But on this night, Murray Mendenhall, the coach of the Pistons, came up with an ingenious game plan. He said, let's take the slow pace of the Lakers and slow it down even more. I mean, they wanted to slow it down to a snail's pace. He figured that their best chance to win was to seriously reduce the number of possessions and hope they get lucky. The Pistons won the opening tip, so the Lakers quickly ran back on defense. When they turned around, they saw Larry Faust from the Pistons just standing near midcourt with a ball in his hip, like he was waiting for the bus or something. The Pistons would hold the ball for as long as four minutes at a time, just standing with it. At the time, there was nothing in the rules that said how long a team could take before shooting the ball. It was not uncommon for teams of the day to just stall and hold the ball if they had a good lead late in the game. In those late game situations, the best strategy was to run out the clock, and stalling helped you do that. But to use a stalling strategy from the very beginning of the game was something completely different. But again, the Pistons coach felt that this was their best chance to win. For that, I don't blame him. If I'm the coach, I will push the rules to their absolute limit in order to win a game. Besides, if they had decided to play the game normally, there was a really good chance that they would lose because the Lakers were just that good. As you can imagine, the fans were booing and screaming for something to happen. The first quarter ends with a score of 8-7 to seven in favor of the Pistons. Nobody was happy about this, except the Pistons. The second quarter was no better as the score at halftime was 13-11 to 11 Lakers. 
Going into the fourth quarter, it was still only 17 to 16 Lakers. This was abysmal. Each team made a single free throw in the fourth quarter, and now it's down to the final minute, with the Lakers leading 18-17. The Pistons run a play for Faust to attack the rim, and he launches a shot that just clears Mikan's outstretched arms and goes in. The Pistons are now in the lead. With a few seconds left, the Lakers take a Hail Mary shot that misses, and the Pistons walk away with a 19-18 victory. The fans were furious. John Kundla, the coach of the Lakers, was furious. He said that he wanted no part of basketball, if that's the way it was going to be played. The commissioner, Maurice Potoloff, was also furious when he found out the next day. He immediately sent a message to all the teams in the league letting them know that this kind of game was to never happen again, because it would kill the league. And he was right. If the NBA had allowed this type of play to continue, the league would have gone out of business in the 1950s. At the time, the league was becoming very stable. But not that stable. At this point in the league's history, there wasn't anybody getting rich by playing it. Nearly every player, even the stars, still had other jobs in the offseason, like selling insurance or working as real estate agents. Each team clearly understood the need to contribute to growing the league and making it something exciting that people would want to buy a ticket to watch. If there was a Hall of Shame, this game would definitely be in it. The game set all kinds of records for scoring that still stand today, but these are not the kind of records that anyone should be proud of. Here is just a handful of the records set that night. Fewest points by one team. Fewest points by both teams together. Fewest shots attempted. Fewest shots made. Fewest points for a single team, etc. You get the point. So keeping the game exciting was of the utmost importance. They had to sell tickets and grow their fan base. 19 to 18 games was not going to cut it. So while each team was committed to playing the game the right way to attract fans, one of the league's owners also knew that they had to put a rule in place to prevent some team in the future from pulling the same stunt. And this is where we go into our second story, about the shot clock. The owner of the Syracuse Nationals was a man named Danny Biasone. By the way, the Nationals would later become the Philadelphia 76ers. Well, Biasone had an idea that would make sure that the game speeds up and stays speeded up. A shot clock. Something that would force teams to shoot or else turn the ball over to the other team. But you couldn't just buy one at a sporting goods store. So he had to build one from scratch in his garage. He tinkered with it for quite a while while also working to convince his fellow owners to adopt a rule change that would bring the shot clock into the game. So why 24 seconds? Well, he went through the box scores from the previous season and realized that teams averaged 60 shots per game. So when you have two teams playing, that means 120 shots per game in total. If you take into consideration that the game is 48 minutes long, it means that a shot is taken every 24 seconds on average. He thought, let's take the average of 24 seconds and make that the limit. If a team cannot shoot within 24 seconds, then the other team would automatically get the ball. The clock that Biasoni came up with looks like a big aluminum box with lights in the front that counted down from 24 seconds to zero. It sat on the floor a couple of feet off the baseline at each end of the court. To finally get the rule changed, there was a meeting of the NBA Board of Governors in Syracuse, New York, where the Nationals played. They met at Vocational High School in August of 1954. This is three seasons after the famous 19-18 game, because sometimes change takes a while. On that day, Biasone had set up a scrimmage between his Nationals players using the new shot clock. So with a representative present from each of the other teams in the league, they got a chance to see what the game would look like with a shot clock. And once they saw the scrimmage, they voted unanimously to add the shot clock to the NBA game. They found a manufacturer to make a bunch of clocks based on Biasoni's design and sent them to each of the nine teams in the league at the time. And the shot clock was an immediate success. Scores around the league jumped. The season before the clock, NBA teams averaged around 80 points a game. Under the new shot clock, average scores jumped up to just under 94 points per game. But most importantly, the fans loved it. Ticket sales were up, 
local TV stations were looking to start putting the games on the air. Now this would bring in TV revenue, and this would bring in a new level of financial stability to the league. Prior to the shot clock, 15 different NBA teams had gone out of business throughout the league's history. Teams like the Toronto Huskies, the Pittsburgh Ironmen, the Detroit Falcons, and the Providence Steamrollers. But since the invention of the shot clock, not a single NBA team has gone out of business. The newer, faster style of play completely changed the game. The slowdown offense that the Minneapolis Lakers used to run with George Mikan completely disappeared. In fact, Mikan himself decided to retire three days before the start of training camp for the 1954-55 season when the shot clock would be introduced. Even though he was only 30 years old, he knew his time had come. He could not keep up with the new speed. He had become a dinosaur overnight. And he had the presence of mind to realize it and bow out gracefully. Thankfully, he had already earned his law degree and he immediately opened his own law practice in Minneapolis upon his retirement. The original commissioner called it the single most important rule change in league history. And I agree with that sentiment. Bill Simmons, the basketball writer, once joked that America should create a $24 bill and put Danny Biasone's picture on it. Just a few years later, in 1958, the Boston Celtics beat the Minneapolis Lakers 173 to 139. The league has not been the same since. And guess who won the 1955 championship? That first one with the shot clock? Well, none other than the Syracuse Nationals owned by Danny Biasone. Talk about putting a feather in your cap. The invention of the shot clock would warrant Biasone's election to the Basketball Hall of Fame, but unfortunately, that did not happen until the year 2000, eight years after he died. He should have been in there way sooner. But at least he is in there. I've been to the Hall of Fame, and his original shot clock is on display there. It's actually pretty cool to look at. As I stared at the box, I thought to myself, that box saved the NBA. And the part that's amazing is that today in the year 2020, 65 years after the invention of the shot clock, it's still 24 seconds. It's never needed to be adjusted. That's an amazing thing. So we salute you, Danny Biasone. Your invention saved the league and serves as a pillar for what the game is today. This has been Basketball History 101. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us next time as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care, and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.